Thank you so much, Shannon, Marilyn, and Mike for joining us um, on this panel discussion on sustainable communities. Through the course, Building Sustainable Communities, the Impact of Engagement, students have learned about key concepts in building sustainable communities, such as community engagement, collaboration, and monitoring and evaluation. As members of a unique community-based partnership, the Brock Lincoln Living Lab, we're looking forward to hearing some of your thoughts on these concepts and sustainable communities in general. So first, we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We gratefully acknowledge that we are on the lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia. As Canadians, we are thankful for the opportunity to live, work, and play here. We honour and uphold the first environmental agreement, which is the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We thank all who have served and continue to share as stewards of this special place. So before we get started, we would love for everyone on the panel to introduce themselves, um, maybe speak briefly about their position and background. Would you be able to start us off, Marilyn? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Thanks, Savannah, and thanks for inviting me to the panel. It's a pleasure. Um, so, yeah, my name is Marilyn Jolino. I'm an associate professor at Brock University, and my home is within the Environmental Sustainability Research Center. I'm the lead faculty member on the Brock Lincoln Living Lab, and I'm also the grad program director for our both Masters of Sustainability and our PhD in sustainability science. And um, my background training is actually as a geographer. Um, and when I went into grad studies, I um, started learning more about um, environmental sustainability, right? So that's kind of, I transitioned into that sort of uh, field of research, yeah. And now into sustainability science. So that's my background. Thank you. Um, Mike or Shannon, would one of you go next? Shannon, go ahead. I think Shannon's on mute. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me, Savannah. I'm the Director of Community Services here at the Town of Lincoln. Uh, the Community Services portfolio is quite a diverse portfolio, including culture and recreation, urban forestry, horticultural services, uh, operations and maintenance of our municipal facilities, parks, um, capital projects. And I've been in uh, municipal government for over 30 years. I've had the pleasure of working in a, in a number of um, larger second tier municipalities and uh, lower tier and, and most recently the town of Lincoln, which is a lovely smaller uh, local municipality. And it's great to be here. Thank you. And Mike, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Savannah. And uh, welcome to those that uh, at some point will be watching uh, this lecture series. Uh, it's great to be here and it's great to be here with Shannon and Marilyn, uh, two individuals who I have uh, a lot of respect for and have worked for uh, with or worked with for the last number of years. Uh, I am the Chief Administrative Officer uh, or CAO, City Manager, uh, whatever title you want to use here for the Town of Lincoln. Um, I think an important part of recognizing where and what Lincoln is. We are in the Niagara region and we are one of uh, Niagara's fastest growing municipalities. And so with that comes a whole set of challenges that I think uh, and opportunities that we'll be talking about today. Uh, my role here really is um, overseeing the delivery of municipal services, uh, 92 different services that we offer uh, and ensuring the long term vision of Lincoln really is integrated into our decision making. Uh, and helps us achieve a sustainable and complete community. Uh, I've been here since uh, the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, so a little over five years. Uh, and uh, in that time, uh, really focused on, on partnerships uh, and developing those partnerships. Prior to um, coming to Lincoln, I was with the City of Hamilton for almost 18 years uh, in a number of positions uh, and had the uh, fortune of also uh, working with the province of Ontario. So a little bit of background in government. Uh, I am a Brock grad. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in biology and a minor in economics. Uh, a little bit diverse, but uh, I was a confused undergrad. 
Um, I also hold a master's degree in management uh, and business leadership uh, and have um, taken a bunch of courses along the way, uh, but happy to be here uh, and happy to be contributing uh, to today's conversation. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so we will now begin the discussion. Um, I'm going to start with the first question, which is, in your opinion, what is a sustainable community? I can start, uh, if you want me to go ahead, uh, uh, with my academic hat on, you know, so many courses that I've taken talk about these, it, you know, sustainable uh, communities using their resources to meet the, the current needs, right, while ensuring that there's adequate resources um, for those in future generations, right? So often you'll see these kinds of communities um, will seek a better quality of life for their residents um, while maintaining nature's ability to function over time. And often these communities involve, you know, thinking about ecological, social, and economic imperatives, right? In the town of Lincoln, what I think really helps them try to achieve their sustainability goals, which they're well on their way to becoming a sustainable community, is that they have focused on environmental sustainability, um, economic and social sustainability. So community health and well-being has really been a priority for them. Being a vibrant community, a resilient community, these are major priorities for the town, right? So I actually think the town of Lincoln is a really great example of that. And they're, you know, facing so many challenges, right? I think more recently about, we're really aware about um, social equity, environmental justice, and they already have that awareness, right? So anyway, so that for me is is a sustainable community. I think Savannah, maybe just to pick up on Marilyn's comment, and she mentioned it, um, you know, I think I've heard it referred to, and I think sometimes, you know, providing a visual descriptor uh, is, is is the easiest way. And so um, it, it's almost like a three legged stool. Um, and, and it really is that interface between economic, social and environment that creates a sustainable community kind of, if you put those uh, circles over each other and you look at where they kind of cross each other to me that's that's that little piece in the middle is that sustainable piece uh, and it's what we as government I think try to do in all our decisions do we achieve it uh, in an equal way each time we're making decisions I would say no um, but I think our goal is often to look at you know the social benefits or the social determinants or the social issues uh, that I think present themselves to us mixed with the economic realities that we're often facing and then of course you know you kind of overlay the environmental piece um and and how that's becoming something uh, that we're talking about more i think we've been talking about sustainable communities for the better part of the last 25 years as long as i've been doing this um and i think only recently uh, am i seeing environment and the ability to quantify the economics of the environmental piece become uh, I, I think such an integral part of what we do so for me, it's that triple, um, that triple legged stool uh, that I look at, and, and that's kind of the visual descriptor I have when I think of um, a sustainable community. I would, uh, I would agree with all of the comments that have been, have been shared. I think you know, fundamentally, it comes down to, um, as a community. Are we well run? Are we well planned, well built, uh, well served? Do we serve our residents well? Um, so I think you know everything that that Marilyn and, and Mike have sort of introduced. It really comes down to the success of, of that community. And as Marilyn touched on, um, a lot of our council's strategic priorities align very well to that. So being a connected, being a welcoming, being a vibrant, being a resilient uh, community. And so as staff who work for the municipality, when you have those guiding imperatives that we can align what we do to our goals and our objectives, it makes it a lot easier as a collective to realize those goals. 
And so Mike is right. I think we're we're doing a great job in moving towards being a sustainable community. And while we are a very small community and a very lean community, um, we function like a, a much bigger community and we operate like a bigger community and we think like a bigger community and and the policies and and things that guide us um, would equal or rival any other larger community that you know in Ontario, Canada and, and, and elsewhere. Thank you all for your answers for that question. Um, the next question, why is community engagement so important for building sustainable communities? How would I jump in to, um, to, to start off with maybe the, the logic of building this Brock Lincoln Living Lab, right? Was a way for us to define how that community engagement would take place using Mike's great example of the Venn diagram, right? Those classic diagrams of, you know, where you have in the center of that diagram, innovative solutions to the challenges we face. And then around that, you have overlapping spheres of, you know, stakeholders, right? So, you know, private businesses, um, municipal government, right? Non-government, academic institutions or knowledge institutions. And that kind of framework provides opportunities to then bring everyone together, you know, with a slightly different lens on particular environmental sustainability challenges that we face, right? And so, you know, that kind of engaging with community and a massive part of that and something that Lincoln has done very successful is to connect with the residents, mm -hmm. right? So to as much as possible, bring in the different voices mm -hmm. around a particular challenge. And we're understanding now that we've excluded some voices, indigenous voices, right, into that. And I think um, that's what is, is really important, right, for us to engage fully um, in, in addressing the challenges, right? And these are, these are massive challenges that require everyone to kind of come to the table and bring their perspective and ideas and knowledge, right? Um, and then import, an important piece of that is to then implement those solutions, right, to our challenges. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great introduction to, to that question, Marilyn. I think, you know, for us um, in community services, we often say it's it's all about people first, right? We do what we do for the residents of this community. And, and we have a saying when we're developing parks that people make parks. So it's not about the staff that decide what should go into a park or potentially how that, that park will be used without doing that research. It's about engaging our community partners, not just our, our residents who are going to use those spaces, but our volunteer organizations who might support and, and assist us or even fund those spaces. It's about really, it's that relatedness to, to, to the community. So when, when you ask about community engagement, I mean, if we're not engaging our community, our businesses, our residents, our uh, partners and organizations, then, then we can't relate to what it is that they need. And I think, um, you need to do that often. You need to do that frequently because things change. And as as you know, and as we've talked, Savannah, in the past about, you know, in 2019, our department did a, a Parks, Rec and Culture Master Plan. Well, then in 2020, there was a pandemic <laughs> that hit. And, you know, so what we knew or what we thought or what we learned back in 2018 and 19 has probably changed and evolved and so we it, it needs to be a, a constant that we engage with our community at all levels um, to really understand what it is they need and and how we can best serve them yeah no i completely agree i think with both um with, with both those comments savannah and for me when i think of engagement and, and the element of engagement relative to what we're trying to do around building sustainable communities I think about change and I think about how do you ready a community 
um, at whatever size, whether it be a community, a province, a country, but how do you ready um, a community for change? Uh, and I think what we're talking about uh, in a lot of ways is change and some of it's new change for, for a number of people in our communities. Um, and some of it's very transformative change, the way we do business, the way we look at things, the types of relationships we have. So I think, you know, engagement helps us um, increase, you know, I would say that kind of ownership that's required. Um, people need to understand issues in order to embrace them, in order to, I think, change and evolve. Uh, and so engagement becomes a, a key element of that. Um, and engagement doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen once. I think oftentimes, um, you know, we, we, we think, you know, if we engage people and we throw information out there, we have a couple sessions, that's enough. But really it's about um, long-term engagement. It's that, you know, working with stakeholders in the long-term, um, you know, and I think, you know, if we do that, we do that well. Uh, it, it Engagement plays a central role in, I think, moving communities forward. So for me, it's about understanding, embracing issues, and again, um, you know, readying everyone for that change. And so that's just a lot of conversations, uh, a lot of, I think, very incremental steps. If I could just quickly add to, um, I entirely agree with uh, both Shannon and Mike on that front. The The other piece, I think, too, is that that engagement allows for the sharing of knowledge, but also resources in terms of human capital, right? So, for example, you know, a couple quick examples, Niagara adapts, right? So Jessica Blythe leading leading the way and leading municipalities through, you know, going from sort of identifying, you know, climate changes and what's happening in these different communities to then, you know, all the way to uh, implementing plans, right? Um, which is is one example that wouldn't that wouldn't be available to municipalities who are often underfunded, under resourced, right? So bringing Brock into the mix, we could then um, have an initiative where we look at community science, collecting data in the community with the community about the urban tree canopy, right? The urban tree canopy has so many benefits in terms of health and well-being, and we know that especially during COVID, right? Um, that it's that it's been a really important resource um, for the community. You know, very there's these simple ways that seem simple to us. We have the equipment, we have the resources, but it's not always simple to a municipality that they can't possibly be stretched in so many different ways, right? Um, so I think that piece has to be highlighted too. I mean, that's a good example, Marilyn. And I think Niagara Adapts happened in a very organic way because we had that level of engagement and partnership. You know, I mean, Marilyn, yourself, Jessica, Ryan Plummer, you know, and I think, you know, myself, we're talking around a table and then I was also sitting around another table with other CAOs from the region and we determined that we had applied for some monies through FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So we were all gonna be doing climate change work, uh, but not doing it in an engaged kind of collaborative way uh, until really that conversation started happening uh, and now I think we're we're better, stronger um, when when the collective folks around the table now represent two, three, four, five hundred thousand people, not fifty thousand people, kind of on a per municipality basis. So um, definitely a great, I think, illustrative example of when you engage not broad-based engagement to the community, but just engagement amongst partners and stakeholders, what you can get and what that leads to. Yeah, thank you both for that. I'm going to dig deeper into partnerships in just a minute. Um, But first, um, I'd like to ask Shannon, um, you are the Director of Community Services within the Town of Lincoln, and as part of your role, you're managing projects and developments in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Culture. How do you work community engagement into these projects and into community services? It's a great question, Savannah, and it's really, um, it is foundational to what we do in community services. So we are very much a, a, an area of the municipality that is citizen touching, citizen engaging, whether it is our parks, whether it is our facilities, whether it is our programming, um, we are out there delivering services for the residents, for the businesses, for, for the organizations who are part of this community. So 
whenever we start a project, it's it's where we begin. It's mm -hmm. that foundational um, starting point from which we work, and and we we engage our community by reaching out to them and and having discussions and asking questions and looking for problems to be solved. And that's really, you know, the starting point. And uh, very recently, we just opened our um, newest park development, Rotary Park. You'll see a, an image behind me in the background. And we're so very proud of it and the results and the, and the accolades and the kind words that we're receiving because it was built by the community and for the community. So, you know, we didn't determine what needed to go into this to park. We, we went out and we, in the park, in the open space before it was a park, we actually invited you know the residents to come out and to speak with us and and to be inspired and tell us how they would use the space or tell us how they would like to use the space and um so you know we do that on on almost every project we undertake and and every service we look to expand and we adjust um you know through the pandemic we weren't able to offer in-person programming and in-person um activities because our facilities had to be closed so we adapted and we adjusted and and you know you heard of curbside uh pickups and and kits that people could take home and so we listened to people which was you know we still want to have these activities we still want to be motivated we still want to be doing things um and we we adjusted so i think you know it's a it's a foundational aspect to what we do in community services here at the town Savannah, if I could, I mean, I think what Shannon and her team did, you know, exceptionally well, and, and she mentioned engaging, but not just engaging residents of a certain age or a certain background, like you had everything from the young toddler mm -hmm. uh, to the senior citizen. So really that kind of, you know, some people say eight to 80. In this case, it was probably 18 months to okay. 88 in terms of engagement. And so it did everything from having an ice cream truck there to get people to come over and then put sticky tabs on what they wanted to see at the park. So that design and planning stage of engagement that Shannon and her team did uh, was more than I think just maybe the technical um, textbook way of doing it. It was okay, uh, two, three, four, five, six year old, um, you know, come have some ice cream, but then tell us, you know, what is it you like to do? Mm -hmm. So some of them wanted a climbing wall and some of them wanted, you know, a certain type of swing and um, so I think it's that level of kind of engagement at a much more granular, um, real level uh, that helps us design and plan things. Um, because I think we've all seen those drawings uh, where we design a sidewalk that maybe looks, um, that is very linear or very directive in one way or another. Uh, but human, I think the way humans, you know, function and, and walk and uh, so forth really means that maybe it should have been a diagonal cutting through this area of the park. Mm -hmm. So it's just I think that you know it's a, it, for me it's one of those examples that un, unless we actually talk to people and see how they're truly engaging and using mm -hmm. things, um, you know the textbook way of doing things sometimes isn't isn't you know uh, what people want to see. And I think when you look at Rotary Park that's behind Shannon over there, uh, what you see is a incredibly dynamic space. Um, that um, we're seeing just hundreds of people use on a daily basis. So That's great, thank you. Um, I think it's really helpful to hear those examples of what community engagement can look like on the ground. Um, so all of you um, are a part of a very special partnership. The town of Lincoln and Brock University have created a partnership called the Brock Lincoln Living Lab. How do partnerships such as this one contribute to building sustainable communities? So maybe I'll start on this one. Um, you know, I, and there's probably a ton I could say, so I will try to be as brief uh, as, as maybe I can. And, and both of my colleagues are laughing because, you know, I think I often say I'm going to try to be brief and then I go on. Uh, so I will try to keep it tight. Um, that said, I think, you know, these types of partnerships allow us to do things together that we couldn't do separately. Um, and in a lot of ways, some of that's funding, some of that's just the speed at which relative organizations move, whether that be government or post-secondary educations. Uh, there's certain things we've applied for together that um, the university takes the lead on. There's other things the municipality takes the lead on. Uh, we both have our own approval bodies and our own approval mechanisms through council, uh, through the board, 
uh, and, and other things. Um, but I think together we're able to achieve a lot more. And, and without that sounding too much like a cliche, um, you know, this came from an idea uh, of really what could we do together um, to move items forward, uh, to really uh, develop a presence uh, for Brock and to really take Brock out into the community. It was one of Brock's kind of strategic planning exercises that really had them being more in the community. But what does that actually mean? And so how do you take what's happening in a very academic theoretical setting, mm -hmm. like a university, and actually, you know, bring that to kind of a local community or any community for that matter, and actually try some of this stuff out on the ground. Is it working? Um, how do we grow? How do we change? How do we evolve? And so we became almost like a Petri dish, um, you know, for an experiment. So there's a little bit of my biology background coming in. So I did learn a lot at Brock. Um, but we're, we're that real life Petri dish, I think, in very real time, experiencing some of these, this, the theoretical stuff that all that, you know, uh, all of you, um, you know, Savannah, Maryland are, are, are teaching, engaging and learning about. Uh, and that's what happens, um, I think, in a municipality and, and especially one like us where you've got, I think, commitment at the council level. You've got commitment at a senior staff level uh, to actually try some stuff out. Um, I've always believed I'd rather try and fail than not try at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think this partnership's allowed that. I have I have to build on that Petri dish analogy. I love that because that's really what the lab is about, right? You know, living labs in general are about taking people out of the lab environment, students, researchers, right, academics, and bringing them together in the community and learning together from the community, right? What's really important about the partnership and and um, something I, I've really appreciated is that, you know, as an academic and a researcher, I need Mike, I need Shannon to tell me, you know, what are those needs? How do things operate at the municipal level, right? Um, they, I think, also benefit through a formalized partnership. They benefit from having access to students, to researchers, and also the students benefit because now you're training students to understand the challenges that municipalities face, and, right? And they're they're training with that community, then they likely will become part of that community. So that does contribute to building sustainable communities because it's education, it's practical experience, it's knowledge sharing. So for all of those reasons, the other piece is that the formalized part of it allows us to really take seriously what we commit to because we're legally obliged, right, to, to meet um, what we set out in the partnership, that we both have goals, but that we come together and we agree to provide, right, students and financial resources and expertise. And that formalized piece of the partnership really, uh, I think, allows people to take it seriously, right, to come up with a budget, an action plan a timeline for when we're going to do certain things and how mm -hmm. we'll do them, right? So it, it really, you know, forces you to think through what are the needs, how do we uh, address those needs, and then how do we kind of implement actions, right, in the community. So that's, uh, I think that's a really important piece to add. Yeah, just to, to add on to what Mike and, and Marilyn have said, I think, you know, I often say, we don't know what we don't know. And so to work with those who study and research and invest in um, you know, problem solving and new methodologies and new ways of doing things, I mean, we have benefited so much from this relationship and, and really hope to continue the relationship, if, I, if I'm being honest, because we need these partners and we need you to be able to work with us as, as Marilyn alluded to it in a, a few questions ago I think you know we're lean and don't have the resources that we would like to to do as much as we'd like to do so I think um, we've had a great experience with the the Lincoln Brock uh, the Brock Lincoln uh, Living Lab and we'd like to see it continue but um, there's just so much benefit 
to us in, in doing so and in having this partnership in place and, and being able to, um, as Mike said, try things and apply things in the real application and, and learn from them because um, as as researchers and and students who are studying this, you're, you're learning things that, that we don't know and haven't tried. And so being able to uh, apply those learnings and, and, you know, create real living labs, if you will, out in the field, whether they're in our parks or whether they're in our, our development and, and what's going on in the community. I mean, it's invaluable to us. Thank you. Um, is there any bit of advice that you all would give to someone looking to create a similar partnership as the Brock Lincoln Living Lab? I would say, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I think we're I all would, excited to chime in. Yeah, on I think we all are. Get to know your community. So get to know who's in your backyard and, and introduce yourselves and become partners and talk about things um, that you haven't talked about. I mean, Mike alluded to the fact that, you know, the, the climate adaptation plan and, and that whole initiative across multiple municipalities started just generically through through conversations and at a very grassroots level. And I think that, um, you know, it's not the, the formalized piece is probably a little uh, newer for, for us. But I mean, I go back to, to my days in working in, in other municipalities and um, taking advantage of the, the post-secondary institutions that, that we had and approaching them and saying, hey, you know, here's here's an idea, here's a project that we have, might you be able to help? And, and I think once you get to the right people and make those connections, it becomes really quite easy because um, I personally have yet to encounter an organization or an individual who doesn't want to collaborate and share and, and work together. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's it's easier than perhaps people would think. And uh, it starts with a conversation. Yeah, I think just picking up on Janet's comment, I mean, be bold, um, be a bit audacious. Um, you know, I, I think when, um, you know, Brock's previous president, uh, President Ferran and, and I sat down and first met, um, you know, Council had kind of challenged me as we looked at our economic development strategy and our assets uh, as to why we couldn't have more of a Brock presence in the community. Uh, and so I think that first conversation really uh, was me saying, yeah, why can't we have more of a presence and let's figure out how we get Brock into Lincoln. Um, and so, you know, I, I think be, be a bit bold, um, go out there and ask. I mean, the worst thing someone can say is no, uh, but in most Times people aren't going to say no. They're going to say, "Well, maybe we can't do that, but we could do this." Um, so be bold, be audacious, throw the idea out there, uh, and then let it kind of permeate. You know how it does uh, to get to where we are. I um, I agree. I agree with Shannon and and Mike. These are um, <clears throat> these are really good pieces of advice. The the other thing I would add, I guess, is <clears throat> to really connect with those people who are open to this kind of thinking that Mike's talking about, right? That are open to sharing ideas and are enthusiastic about it. You need enthusiastic people to support you. So, you know, I think about the mayor, the town of Lincoln, Sandra Easton, right? I think about Mike and Shannon and the whole team, senior management team and beyond, right? Um, have that enthusiasm to to bring our ideas together, right? To creatively solve some of these challenges, and that's tricky, right? It's hard to to have that communication at times, right? Because of the way that you know we operate at the university versus the town. So, secondly, I would say understand the the way that the organization or institution is governed, right? something very simple you know we operate in terms right whereas the town operates in quarters right so what we call you know term two or three they're calling quarter two or three and they're very different times of the year right so understanding how they're governed how they operate is is really important and the last bit of advice would be to really develop a plan and you know carefully decide on what 
projects or what activities you'll pursue and how, you know, what budget is attached to those and how you scope that work so that, you know, you do, you know, as, as best as you can clearly define what that work looks like. I mean, allowing for flexibility, right? Like COVID really forced us to rethink those. So you have to be flexible as well, right? When you come to realize that this isn't working anymore or this isn't where we want to go. We want to, you know, so to be adaptable as well. And and you have to do that with your partner, right? Um, so that that's the, those are the bits of advice I would add. Thank you all for those bits of advice. I'm sure they'll be really helpful to students in this course. Um, one thing that the students in module one, which has this focus on community engagement, um, have learned is about how community engagement, the concept has kind of formed and evolved over time. Um, so we're really lucky in this panel of discussion to have both academic and professional leaders in your fields. and. We're wondering where do you hope the field of work and research around community engagement to continue to evolve and grow in the coming years? I think personally, the, the last year and a half has really highlighted a few things for me, right? Um, social justice and equity, environmental justice. Um, I think about climate change as one of the major challenges that we face. Um, we have a lot of opportunity. Mike talked about opportunities too, right? Not just challenges, there's some kind of negative connotation to that. These are opportunities. And I would love for the research to go in the direction of how do you engage with Indigenous communities, right? That engagement in the past has uh, has been a little bit challenging, right? There have been times when researchers have gone into communities, you know, conducted the research and then taken that with them, right? And that's, that's now we realize that practice maybe isn't um, going to lead us to a better place in terms of building sustainable communities, right? Um, so how do we engage all of those different stakeholders in the community, right, in a way that that promotes sustainability, right? So so for the research, you know, we we really need to learn more. I'm hearing a lot from colleagues around, okay, how do we do that, right, in a real genuine way that makes a difference? You know, I realized in working with um, one of our students, a thesis student in the town of Lincoln, we actually started looking at social and environmental justice and thinking about not just where is the urban tree canopy, but then looking at individual communities within the town of Lincoln, right? And started thinking about how would we address this issue um, of inequality, right? Sometimes more affluent areas, according to the research, um, have a, a better tree canopy, right? A more full canopy, a healthier canopy, and these canopies are linked to health and well-being, right? So while we, in the thesis itself, have not have a had a chance to look at that piece, I've started reading about this, and we've thought about doing another study on that as well, right? Looking at that issue and others have looked at that issue. So, you know, I think about that. I think about, you know, um, the research in terms of adapting to climate change, thinking about agricultural best practices. Um, and so we've worked with Jillian now at the town and um, looked at our um, connecting with our colleagues at the uh, Vineland Research and Innovation Center to start thinking about that as well. How do you harness water? right, for agricultural um, producers as one example, right? Thinking about urban infrastructure, the town is already thinking a lot about low impact development opportunities, about green infrastructure. This is not something that town's just picking up. They've, like Mike suggested, 
they've been thinking about this for years, right? They're, they're very proactive rather than reactive, right? Which sets them up, I think, for success. So that's my, that's my piece to that question. I mean, maybe just to add a little bit to, to Marilyn, I think, you know, as government, you know, we, we don't deal in the same currency as the private sector or even, um, you know, the education sector. I mean, we deal with community trust uh, and confidence in our decisions. Uh, and so at the end of the day, community engagement uh, and community engagement as it relates specifically to what it looks like in the future and sustainability is and should look um, different. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we often talk about engagement and we assume, well, if we outreach to someone and share information with them, that's engagement. Uh, that's information sharing. And so I think if you truly want engagement, that means being open to kind of some of those tough conversations that we've talked about today. Um, you know, social media uh, is an interesting element uh, in terms of just the organic level engagement happens. So oftentimes, uh, we do engagement in a very closed community style fashion, uh, social media and, and the iterative, fast paced and, and organic, um, you know, snippets that kind of come out of it is another way to do it. So what does it look like in the future? Um, community moderation is an important piece of that as well. And so, again, I think it's, um, you know, engagement in the future, you know, to me looks you know, different than it does now. It, it, it at the end goal really is to build trust in what we're doing um, and to make it fun along the way. Um, you know, I think some of the stuff we're talking about, again, you know, we talked about park development, talked about some of our cultural amenities. Those things uh, are fun and, and people should see themselves in it when we're developing those. Uh, it's not just about us sitting around a boardroom table and, and devising what a community looks like. Uh, it's about hearing from the community and similarly educating the community uh, on what that looks like um, because it does take time effort money and, and a whole bunch of other things um, along the way uh, and so i think um, you know if you kind of harness all of that you can really um, create i think i'll be bold to say you know some epic um, community engagement and community development outcomes Yeah, I think to uh, to just perhaps expand on on what uh, our CAO has suggested, you know, for me, um, it's not so much identifying or thinking about a new area of research that perhaps we we haven't studied yet or gone deep on, but really when I think about um, you know sustainable communities and 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 government and what we do. I'd like to see us evolve what we do and how we do it. So, you know, we're very um, creative and innovative in our engagement strategies, but I'd like to take it further. So, you know, when I look, think about the, the Rotary Park, um, it's a big, beautiful, massive park that, that, as our CAO said, is used by hundreds almost on a daily basis. But think about the impact that has on our resources. If you have that many people in there and you've got things like garbage or litter or even vandalism, you know, we need more in the way of resources than we have to, to, to support that. So maybe we create a, um, you know, friends of the park group and, and truly have residents participating in, you know, litter pickup or in identifying, you know, when, when they, see vandalism happening um, and, and, and being able to go out there and almost being a part of what we do as a municipality and, and acting on our behalf and, and acting on the behalf of the community. So when I think about municipal government in, you know, 30 years from now, I'd like to think it's going to be very different with the partnerships and, and these, these projects that we've talked about today and these formalization of these partnerships, they are just going to be the norm. They won't be the exception. They will be the norm. And you'll see ongoing partnerships with the no. business community, with the post-secondary, with, you know, residents. I, I really would like to think that, you know, that's where we're going to go in the, in the true sense of uh, sustainable communities. I mean, Savannah, one example last night, um, you know, we brought forward a pilot project to look at a single-use plastics ban. Um, to me, you know, a great example of something sustainable kind of in the in the present moment. 
Um, to Shannon's point, something like this that's a pilot project that we're now saying, oh my God, we're going to ban single use plastics in the future should be just the course of business. It should be the course of the way we do things. So, you know, I think it is about how do we meet, you know, and council asks these questions. What are the impacts? Shannon and her team ask these questions. What are the impacts of all of our decisions um, on something like banning single use plastic? So how do you meet the needs of the present and the present moment, which is what we're doing right now without compromising, I think, the ability of the future. And, you know, I mean, you know, if I look at, you know, we talked about whether it be our siblings, our children um, who are in that kind of 12 to 13 year old range beginning at the beginning of this little session uh, that we're having. So how do you not compromise the future, um, but at the same time meet some of the present needs that we have? And, and for me, it, that really encapsulates, I think, sustainable communities and community sustainability as we look to the future. So let's do some things now so that we aren't compromising the future. And it's not drastic change that um, gets so much pushback. It is incrementally moving things along, albeit sometimes you need to stand for something and you need to be bold and I think go out there on a limb uh, and that's okay too. So marry incremental change with bold vision. If I could just pick up on that thread because Mike raised a really, really critical issue around education, right? And, um, you know, the, the town of Lincoln has been really open to looking again at the urban tree canopy. And um, I'm part of Geospatial Niagara um, I sit on their board. It's a not-for-profit that's interested in promoting geo-literacy and promoting environmental initiatives, right? And um, one thing we've done that we want to do in Lincoln is to go in and look at the tree canopy around schools. We have access to that those sites, right? So imagine in the future where we start to build stories and engage people in different ways through storytelling, through activities, so bring in a couple GPS handheld units into a school, even have the city donate a tree that we could plant, then teach those students about that tree, have them care for that tree, nurture that tree, understand how it grows and you know why it's important to think about the soil health and all of those pieces. I think of Merritt Island too, and I'm sure Lincoln does this as well, where you know, they've allowed people now, mind you, they're purchasing a, a plaque, but now they can purchase a plaque and say this tree was donated in the name of somebody who's important to them. Right. And now that that tree, you know, people want to go back to that tree or visit that tree and feel a sense of community. And from that, I think they have a vested interest in the health and well-being of the people in the community, right? And it allows them to learn a bit more about community members. And I think those pieces are really important. The learning, the sharing of, of life experiences with each other. And that may help also um, educate people who maybe haven't had an interest to bring them into the discussion, right? Some of the challenges like climate change, you know, require all of us 100% to to be focused on, you know, how do we address that challenge, right? So education and outreach, I see, is a really critical part of that. And I'm glad Lincoln's open to that, right, which is fantastic. Thank you. It's really inspiring to hear all of your hopes for how community engagement and building sustainable communities can evolve and your um, aspirations for where it will go. Um, and honestly, that's a perfect place to end this panel discussion. I want to thank you, Marilyn, Shannon, and Mike so much for contributing, sharing your insights and expertise. I think um, this is truly going to be um, a useful and helpful resource for all the students in this course. Thank you.